It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Human Ohadi from Caltech. And uh, Human is a professor of applied and computational math and control and dynamical systems at the California Institute of Technology. His research is um, focused on modeling and analysis of systems characterized by uncertainties, noise, multiple scales, and geometric structures. At the center of his work are fundamental problems such as the optimal quantification of uncertainties in the presence of limited information, multi-scale analysis with non-separated scales, and geometric integration of stochastic mechanical systems. And on a personal note, um, when the uh, conference chairs asked the, the organizing committee to volunteer to pick someone to introduce, I will admit that I waited a minute or two to try not to seem over eager, but I didn't even look again at the speaker list. I had seen Dr. Ohadi was speaking, and I thought, wow, it would be such a great honor to introduce him. So this should be a wonderful talk, and um, welcome. Well, thanks for the kind introduction, and uh, thanks for the invitation. So, the main question that I would like to ask in this talk is, can we, to some degree, turn a scientific problem into a UQ problem, and to some degree, solve it as such in an automated fashion using techniques developed to deal with missing information in epistemic and model uncertainty? And the problem that I'm going to consider has a priori nothing to do with UQ. So it is the problem of finding a method for solving a linear system as fast as possible. The linear system that we're going to consider, um, so let's see, I'll get this thing working, is going to be the following divergence form elliptic PDE. And to make it a bit challenging, we're going to assume its coefficients to be in an infinity of omega. So we're going to assume the coefficients to be rough. Now, if you discretize this PDE, this simply means that at a discrete level, on each tet of the fine mesh, your conductivity A can be anything, provided that it is bounded from below and from above. Okay? So this problem has a priori nothing to do with UQ, and the main question that I want to ask is, can we turn it into a UQ problem and solve it as such? So before I do that, let me mention that this problem has received a great deal of attention and some wonderful methods have been developed to address it. And amongst those methods, you will find multi-grid methods and multi-resolution methods. And these methods will give you linear complexity if you have smooth coefficients but they will start breaking down when you have lack of smoothness. Now, robust and algebraic multigrid will give you some degree of smoothness, but the problem of generalizing multi-resolution and multigrid to rough coefficients remains open. Why? Because the interpolation, and opera in the interpolation operators are unknown. We don't know how to bridge scales with rough coefficients, okay? Now, amongst these methods, you will also find low rank matrix decomposition methods, and here you have the fast multiple method and the hierarchical matrix method. And the hierarchical matrix method has a proof of complexity for rough coefficients due to Bebendorf, and the complexity is in n log of n to the power dimension plus three, where n is the number of degrees of freedom in your system. Okay? Well. So what is the common team between these methods? Um, okay. So the common team is that their process of discovery is essentially based on intuition, brilliant insight, and sometimes plain guesswork. You have to use your brain to find them. And the question that I want to ask now is, can we turn to some degree this process of discovery into an algorithm? Can, a mach can you use a machine not only to implement the method, but to find the method itself. Now, although the question may seem a bit unorthodox, it's 
Answer appears to be yes. You can do it by identifying an underlying information game and finding an optimal strategy for playing the game. You will still need to use your brain, but the part where you use your brain is in the part where you identify the, the game. And the part that you play, where you play the game is completely mechanical, so a machine could a priori do it for you. And if you do that, if you look for the game and you find it and you play it, then you will obtain a resulting method that has complexity n log square of n. And this is not a conjecture, it is a theorem. Okay. So before I show you what the, what the game is and how to look for it and how to play it, let me give you an idea of what the method is. So the method essentially looks like an eigenspace decomposition in the sense that it will take the solution space of UPDE, so H10 of omega here, and it will decompose it into a direct sum of subspaces that are mutually orthogonal with respect to the scalar product associated with the energy norm of the PDE. And such that the condition number of the operator within each subspace is uniformly bounded independently from the number of degrees of freedom in the PDE and independently from the subspace itself. Now, the method also quarks like an eigenspace decomposition in the sense that since these subspaces are orthogonal, you can solve your PDE independently in each subspace. And if you look at the stiffness matrix of your PDE within that subspace, it will have a uniformly bounded condition number. So you can just relax in that subspace to find the solution of your PDE in that subspace. So finally, the method also swims like an again space decomposition in the sense that it will induce a multi-resolution decomposition of the solution space. And if you use it to solve the wave equation with rough coefficients, you will get a, co a method of complexity n log square of n. And it will be such that you can propagate at each time step. So this is only for the discretized uh, in time wave equation. You can propagate the solution at each time step independently in each subspace. So it looks like, quarks like, swims like an against space decomposition, but it is not an against space decomposition, and in particular, it doesn't have the complexity of an against space decomposition. In the sense that if you have a finite element space of H10 of omega of dimension n, typically the one that you get with your little hat functions, then this eigenspace like decomposition can be performed and stored in complexity n log square of n. Furthermore, if you look at the underlying basis functions spanning these subspaces, they look like and behave like wavelets, okay? So first they are localized, they are not diffused like Fourier modes, and they can be used to compress the operator and locally analyze the solution space, okay? So this is essentially an idea of what the method is, but what I mainly want to talk about is how you get it. And to get it, you have to turn the process of discovery into an information game. And before I show you the complete game that you need to play to find the multi-resolution method, I want to show you a partial game. So what I'm going to show at, at this stage is this partial game. So in this partial game, we are going to give ourselves M functions, I'm going to call them measurement functions, I'm going to call them phi1, phi2, phi m, and those are functions of L2 of omega. And we're going to have two players, player A and player B. Okay, so that I say that I am player A and you are player B. And I, as player A, I'm going to choose the right-hand side of the PDE and the unit ball of L2. I'm not going to show it to you, nor am I going to show you the solution of the PDE. But I am going to show you the solution of the PD integrated against these measurement functions, phi1 and phi m. And your job 
is to guess, to guess what the solution of the PD is. And we're going to call your guess U star, okay? And your guess is going to combine with my choice of G through U, and you're going to get an L2 error. And since this is an adversarial game, I'm going to try to maximize your error, and you're, trying to mi you're going to try to minimize it. And the question is, how would you play this game if you had to play it? Now, before I answer that question, I need to give you a quick reminder about, about determ deterministic zero-sum games, okay? So, this is a finite game, and it is a zero-sum game. And again, you have two players, player B, player A, and player B. Say that I am player A and you are player B. I have two marbles in my hand. I have a red marble and a blue marble. And you have two, two marbles in your hand. You have a red marble and a blue marble. And at the count of three, we are going to show each other a marble. If both of them are red, I win three points. If both of them are blue, I win one point. If the colors do not match, you win two points and I lose two points. So it's a zero-sum game. Whatever you win is what I lose. Question, how should A and B play the repeated game? Well, a surprising result from game theory going all the way back from going all the way back to von Neumann and Nash is that optimal strategies are mixed strategies. The optimal way to play the game is at random. What does it mean? It means that the optimal way for me to play is to choose red with some probability p and blue with probability 1 minus p. And the optimal way for you to play is to choose red with probability q and blue with probability 1 minus q. And if you want to find the optimal strategy, you have to solve a min-max problem over p and q. And if you do that, you will see that the best strategy for you is to play red with probability 3.8. And if you do that, my expected payoff does not depend on my choice for P. It will just be minus 1 over 8. So this is a winning game for you on average if you choose the optimal strategy. Now, let's go back to our original game. Now, our original game, game is a continuous and infinite dimensional game. But as in decision theory, under compactness, and you can put some compactness in there, it can be approximated by a finite game. And as a result, the best strategy for A to play is at random, and the best strategy for B is to pretend that A is playing at random and to look for an optimal strategy in the Bayesian class of strategy or estimators. Now, what does it mean? It means that player B, so you, you are going to pretend that I am playing at random. I may not be playing at random, but you are going to pretend that I'm going to do that. And instead of considering this deterministic PDE, uh, you are going to use a surrogate in which you are going to replace the right-hand side G that could be deterministic by a random field. And you may want to do that because you don't know G anyway, and you don't know U anyway, but you may know the distribution of that random field, okay? So instead of looking at this deterministic PDE, you are going to look at this stochastic PDE. And your bet, your best guess on what U is, is simply going to be the conditional expectation of the solution of the stochastic PDE conditioned on the measurements of the solution of the deterministic PDE. Okay, so this is one possible bet for you, one possible mixed strategy. Now, if you want to find the optimal mixed strategy, you need to solve a min-max problem over all possible distributions on C. Okay? Now, the, per the first thing that we are going to, to do before continuing is to restrict the distribution of Xi to be that of a Gaussian field of mean zero and covariance function gamma. 
And we want to do this for computational efficiency. Why? Because we need to compute these conditional expectations, and these conditional expectations become really become linear uh, if if you use a Gaussian prior. Okay. So if you assume if you assume your right hand side, your random field, to be a Gaussian field then elementary gambles will form a deterministic basis function for your bet, for player's B bet. What does it mean in practice? It means that your bet, your guess of what U is, we have called it U star, can be written as a linear combination of the measurements of the solution U of the deterministic PDE, and the coefficients in front of these uh, measurements are deterministic functions. And these deterministic functions are essentially elementary gambles or bets, or we're going to call them gamblets, and they correspond to your bet of, on what you should be if your measurement of the solution against phi i is one and your measurement of the solution against phi j is zero for uh, all j not equal to, to i, okay? Okay. <clears throat> so what are these gamblets? Well, they depend on gamma, the covariance function of the noise C, which is part of your decision space, player's B decision. And they also depend on these measurement functions phi i. And these are parts of the rules of the game. Now, if you take the covariance function to be delta of x minus y, where delta is a mass of Dirac, so if you take the random field to be white noise, and if you take your measurement functions to be masses of Dirac's centered at points x i of the domain, so what you are really measuring are the values of your solutions at this point. And if you take the conductivity of the PDE A to be identity, then you find out that these psi i's are polyharmonic splines. So you rediscover polyharmonic splines that were originally discovered by Harder and Domare and Duchamp in the 70s. And if you assume the coefficients of your PDE are rough, then you rediscover rough polyharmonic splines, which are essentially a generalization of polyharmonic splines to rough coefficients. Now, this is what you get if you don't play the game optimally. Now, question, what would you get if you played optimally? Well, so what is your best strategy? What is your best choice for the covariance function of the noise? Well, your best choice is to take the covariance function to be the differential operator itself. Now, this simply means that if you integrate the noise against a function f, you obtain a random variable with mean zero and variance the energy norm of f. Okay? Now, why is that? Uh, I will show you why in the algebraic generalization of this method. So, we're going to postpone that. I will just mention that if, if you choose your covariance function to be the differential operator itself, then your best bet, u star, is the finite element solution of the PDE in the linear space spanned by the image of the measurement functions under the inverse of the PDE. So you have a, an optimality in the Galerkin sense, and this optimality is a bit surprising because what you are, what you are really measuring is not g, you are just measuring u, but you get some kind of finite element method optimality. Furthermore, your gamblets, your basis functions, will have optimal variational properties. So if you take a linear, co linear combination of these basis functions, these gamblets psi i with coefficients w i, you will get a function psi that will minimize the energy norm subject to the constraints that its measurement, its integral against each, each 
measurement function phi j must be equal to the coefficient uh, wj that is in there. And because of this variational property, we have a variational characterization of each gamblet. So each gamblet, psi i, is the unique minimizer of the energy norm subject to the constraints, to measurement constraints that the measurement of psi against psi i is one and the measurement of psi against psi j is zero for j not equal to i. Okay, so you get the variational characterization. Okay. Now, how should we choose the measurement functions? So there are parts of the rule of the game. And here for this banded operator, you can do the simplest thing you can imagine. And the simplest thing will be to choose them to be indicator functions of a partition of omega of resolution h. And if you do that, uh, then you will see that the accuracy of your recovery in energy norm is bounded by the resolution of your, of your measurement. So it's going to be proportional to h. So, and then what are these elementary gambles, psi i? Well, psi i is simply going to be your best bet on what the solution of this PDE U could be, given the information that the average of, or the integral of U over this square I is one, and the integral of U over each other square is zero. Okay. Okay. Now, you can also see, because these gamblets are essentially projections of a Gaussian field, these gamblets, the gamblet psi i, is going to decay exponentially fast away from the square i. And you can, you can see this uh, uh, numerical illustration of this gamblet. It, behaves, it really behaves like a wavelet. Uh, this is a 2D illustration. This is a slice around the x-axis. And this is, a, this is a, the same plot, but in log scale. And you, you really see this exponential decay. And because of this exponential decay, uh, you can localize the computation of these gamblets to subdomains of size h log of a, 1 over h, where h is, again, the resolution of your partition of omega without any loss of accuracy in your recovery. So what do I mean? I mean that if you, instead of betting with the original gamblet psi i, you bet with the localized gamble, gamblets, but with the same measurement functions, uh, the accuracy of your recovery in energy norm will still be pro proportional to h. And again, this is provided that you localize the computation of your gamblets to, su to subdomains of size h log of 1 over h, okay? And you get hit by a log because you have an exponential decay, okay? Okay. Now, what you have seen up to now was the formulation of the partial game. Now I need to, for the multi-grid, multi-resolution method, I need to show you the formulation of the, of the hierarchical game. So what is that formulation? So to define the rules of the game, I'm going to give myself a hierarchy of nested measurement functions. And by this, I simply mean that my measurement functions, I'm going to assume that my measurement functions at level k are a linear combination of measurement functions at level k plus one. So for example, you can take these measurement functions of level k to be indicator functions of a hierarchical and nested partition of your domain omega of resolution hk to be equal to two to the power minus k, okay? So for instance, at level one, my measurement functions could be indicator functions of these four squares. At level two, my measurement functions could be indicator functions of these uh, four by four, 16 squares. And at level three, my measurement functions could be uh, measurement functions of this uh, eight by eight, 64 squares, etc. Now, in a discrete setting, uh, you are simply going to 
aggregate elements as in algebraic multigrid to obtain uh, partitions of unity approximations of these indicator functions at different levels of resolution. So here you have an illustration of what these measurement functions look like at a discrete level at six different levels of resolution. And at the finest scale, you just have the finest element of your finite element method. So those are, those are basically the elements that you are using to discretize your, your PDE. Okay. Now, this is the formulation of the hierarchy of games. So again, you have two players. And let's assume that I am player A, and let's assume that you are player B. And again, I'm going to choose the right-hand side of the PDE G in a unit ball of L2. And I'm not going to show you to you, nor am I, going, am I going to show you the solution. Instead, I'm going to show you the solution measured integrated against these measurement functions of level k. So for instance, I'm going to show you the solution u integrated against the first square, the second square here, the third square, and the fourth square. And your job, your role in this game will be to predict what the solution u itself is and what is the average of the solution on each of these 16 squares. So what is the average of the solution against the next level of measurement functions? Okay? So it is a repeated iterated game, but it is, it is a repeated game across scales. Okay. So as before, this doesn't change. Your best strategy, if you were to play this game, will be to replace the right-hand side of the PDE by a Gaussian field of mean zero and of covariance function, the differential part of the PDE itself. And your best bet, based on measurements of level k, is simply the conditional expectation of the solution of the stochastic PDE, conditioned on the measurement of level k of the solution of the deterministic PDE of, yeah. And this will basically form a sequence of approximation for you. Those are deterministic approximations of the solution of the deterministic PDE. There is no randomness whatsoever in this. We just use randomness to come up with our deterministic approximation. But the surprising result is that this sequence of approximation form a martingale under the mixed strategy emerging from the game and under the filtration induced by the hierarchy of measurements. Okay? Now at this stage, since we have a martingale, we could use powerful martingale convergence results and concentration inequalities to show the convergence of our, of our uh, approximations. But we are not going to do that because we don't want to get a probabilistic method. At the end of the day, we want a completely deterministic method. So again, the method is not random. It is deterministic. We just use randomness to find the method itself and to analyze it. So as before, the accuracy of your, the, your bet based on measurements of level k in energy norm is proportional to uh, the resolution of the partition of level k. So we're going to call hk that resolution. Typically, we're going to take it to be 2 to the power minus k. So it's going to be a decreasing ge geometric sequence. And you can see this numerically. So this is, uh, a, a, those are your uh, best bets based on measurements of level 1, 2, 3, four, five, and six. And at the last level, I'm showing you everything, so you're going to recover the solution itself up to numerical accuracy. And this is a, this is a, a log plot of the relative error in energy norm, and you see this exponential decay. Right? And you see it because I'm choosing hk here to be two to the power minus k. And the, at the last step, I'm showing you the last measurements, and here you recover everything up to numerical precision. Okay. Now, 
Another interesting, so as before, the elementary gamb uh, gambles for this game, for this hierarchy of games, form a hierarchy of deterministic basis functions for players B hierarchy of bets, for, for, so for your hierarchy of bets, and I'm calling Psi IK this gamblets. And this is an illustration of what these gamblets look like at six levels of resolution. And I'm taking my resolutions to be two to the power minus k. Okay, so this is exactly as before. You just have a hierarchy of them. Now, an interesting point about these gamblets is that they are nested in the sense that if I define VK to be the linear space spanned by gamblets of level K, then VK is a subset of VK plus one. This simply means that I can write gamblets of level K as a linear combination of gamblets of level K plus one. And the matrix that enters in this linear combination is in fact the interpolation and prolongation of operator of multigrid. So this is the missing piece of information for multigrid for graph coefficients. It is this matrix. And it has an interesting uh, game theoretic in interpretation. The entry Rij of that matrix is essentially your best bet on the integral of the solution of the PDE against the square j of level k plus one, given the information that the integral of the PD against the square i of level k is one, and zero in each other square of level k. Okay, so that's the interpret interpretation of the interpolation operator. Okay, so at this stage, you can finish with classical multigrid, you can go on through your VW cycles, but we want a bit more than this. We want a multi-resolution decomposition. So how are we going to do this? So we are going to look at a slightly different uh, elementary gamble. We're going to introduce the elementary gambles that I'm going to call chi. And chi i is going to be your best bet on the value of the solution u of the PDE given the information that the integral of the solution u of the PD against the square i is one, and minus one against in an adjacent square, and zero in all the other squares, okay? And I'm just going to define adjacent using the hierarchy of the partition. So this new, Elementary gambles are simply straightforward differences of previous gambles. And, if, and I'm going to use again the hierarchy of the partition to, to define what I mean by adjacent. So for instance, for this core square, I have two levels, of, uh, two, le two levels in my hierarchy, and in this core square, I can define three of these gamblets because the fourth one is going to just to be a linear combination of these three, okay? So this is an illustration of what these new gamblets look like. Oops. And they essentially look like wavelets. Uh, so this is at, at level one, level two, level three, level four, level five, and level six. And level six is essentially the finest mesh. Okay. Now, so I've, again, I've called VK the linear space spanned by the original gamblets that I've called Psi. And I'm going to call WK the linear space spanned by these new ga gamblets that I'm calling Chi. And the result that you get if you define these two, two things is that WK plus one is the orthogonal complement of VK into VK plus one with respect to the scalar product associated with the energy norm of the PD. So it is exactly as what you would do with wavelets, but instead of doing this orthogonal decomposition L2, you are doing it in H10 
and you are doing it in a way that is adapted to the PD itself. And as a result, what you get is a, is a orthogonal, is a direct sum orthogonal decomposition of the solution space H104 mega into subspaces that are mutually orthogonal with respect to the scalar product associated with the energy norm of the PDE. Okay? And you also get a multi-resolution decomposition of the solution in the sense that you get that the difference of your approximation at level k plus one and k, so I'm calling this uk plus one minus uk, is the finite solu element solution of UPDE in that space WK plus one. And since these subspaces are orthogonal, subband solutions can be computed independently from each other. Okay. So the other thing that you get is that if you look at this stiffness matrix in that subspace WK, it is going to have a saturation effect and it is going to be uniformly bounded independently from the number of degrees of freedom in your PDE and in the, independently from the value of K itself. So you can just relax, use a relaxation method in that subspace to get your solution. And this is a log scale plot. You see the saturation effect. This is the stiffness matrix in the W space. This is the stiffness matrix in the V space. This one blows up, this one will saturate. Okay. Now, uh, those are the coefficients of the solution in the gamblet basis, and as you do in wavelet, you can truncate and you get a, a compression of your operator. So you can use these things, but instead of analyzing images, you can an analyze your, your operator itself and the solution space of your, of your operator. So the last thing that remains to be done is to, uh, to define a to come up with a fast gamblet transform, and you can do it, and it will be of complexity n log square of n. And the complexity is based on three properties. The first one is nesting, which simply means that level k gamblets and stiffness matrices can be computed from level k plus one gamblets and stiffness matrices. Well-conditioned linear systems and localization. You can localize everything. At the end of the day, you will get a method of complexity n log square of n, and the operating diagram of your method will be that of uh, inverted pyramid. And it is parallel both in space and in frequency. And this is a bit surprising because if you go in the Fourier domain, you are parallel in frequency but not in, in space. And if you use hard functions, you are parallel in space but not in frequency. This, this, this is going to give you a parallel operating diagram both in space and on, in frequency. So you can compute solutions at the finest level and as soon as you have computed the gamblers at the finest level, you can go on computing the solution of UPD at that scale. And at the same time, in parallel, you can compute the gamblers at the next level of hierarchy, and you can go on computing these things, okay, yeah, et cetera. So uh, I will not show you the generalization to the linear system. I've been asked to give you some perspective, so this is what I'm going to do if I have two minutes. Okay, so uh, how is this related to model uncertainty? And I, here I want to give you some motivations for developing this kind of framework and this kind of calculus. And to, to give you motivation, I'm going to use an analogy. Uh, two centuries ago, if I were to ask you to solve a PDE, uh, you will probably use your brain to do that, and you will probably use the, you will probably need the expertise of a Cauchy or Poisson to do that, and you will probably only come up with qualitative estimates of the solution. If I ask you the same question today, you're not going to use your brain to solve the PD. You're going to use your brain to program a laptop to solve the PD for you, okay? Now, what if today I ask you to find the best climate model? Well, you are going to use your brain for that. And then, once you have your model, you will implement it on a high-performance computing cluster to numerically evaluate your model against the data. And the part where you use your brain is not based on a rational framework. Why? Because you have incomplete information on underlying processes, you have limited computational capability, you don't know the underlying probability distributions, and you have limited data. So a question. Can a machine compute the best climate model? Now, if you think about this question a little bit, you realize that you have two major problems. 
The first one is that even if you have access to the most powerful computer in the universe, what do you compute? Okay, you need to have a well-defined, well-posed problem and it is not well-posed. And the second problem is that the space of models is infinite and calculus on a computer is discrete and finite. Okay? So we need two things. We need a framework to turn this problem into a well-posed one. And we need a form of calculus allowing us to manipulate infinite dimensional information structures. So I don't have to, the time to show you what this calculus lo could look like, but let me show you what the framework could be. And that framework could essentially be a generalization of game and decision theory in which you, you have two players, player A and player B. Player A is going to choose a candidate for what the real system could be. Player B is not going to see that candidate. He's, he's only going to get data from it. He's going to choose a model and the candidate and the model will combine and player B will get a loss. And it's an adversarial game. Player A will like to maximize this loss. Player B will like to minimize it. Okay. And again, as you expect from game theory and statistical decision theory is that the best strategy to play this game, if you can put some compactness into the game, will be obtained by, in a, by finding the worst prior. So here you have to use some duality arguments in the Bayesian class of estimators. So you have to solve a min-max problem uh, over measures, over spaces of measures and functions. So this is a doubly infinite dimensional form of calculus. Um, and this is essentially what we're trying to develop. Uh, okay, I don't have the time to show you this. And I will, I will stop here and I will thank you for your attention. So I think we have time for a couple of questions. Before we um, get to the questions, I just wanted to remind people that right after this talk at 9 o'clock is the prize ceremony, so please stay for that. And if you're going to ask a question, please go to one of the microphones so everyone can hear you. No. Uh, very interesting talk. I was just wondering uh, whether these ideas can be generalized to different PDEs, maybe non-linear, no uh, elliptic PDEs. Uh, so you can, you can generalize the game, but at some point you need to compute a conditional, expected vi a conditional expectation. And the computation of the conditional expectation will be hard in the non-linear PD. So you can, you can generalize the notion of optimality of the game. If you can actually compute those posterior values, yes. But you will have an essential difficulty here. And the difficulty is that you will need to compute this conditional expectation. And these elementary gambles are not going to form a basis for your non-linear PD because you are, you are using linearity for, for that here. Well, if there aren't any more questions, let's thank the speaker again.